First, a little warning. Uh, many very good things have been said here today. Uh, my approach is a little different. And I told my friend, Dr. Peak, last night that I was afraid that not many US generals in the army would agree with me. This was the warning. Now, the world has changed in the course of the 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And these changes have affected the whole world community. In some areas, however, we are still living in the old order. My generation was born in between wars. I was born in 1948, soon after the close of the Second World War, and at the outset of a new war, the Cold War. In this interim period, the United Nations came into being, replacing the League of Nations, which uh, had been democratic in structure, but lacking in support of the great military powers. The UN power structure was meant to remedy this by having a security council, giving the superpowers a deciding role, in other words, a governing structure was established where the biggest stakeholders held the real reins of power with a right to veto democratic decisions reached by the UN Assembly. Ambitions and expectations were high at the time, and this was reflected in a progressive UN Charter with its strong call for the respect of human rights. There was also determination to face with justice any violation of human rights, not to speak of genocide. The first steps were promising. Following the Nuremberg trials in 1945-46, the Genocide Convention was adopted and the International Court was established, indeed built on the foundation of a former Court of Arbitration. In short, in this interim period between wars, we ended up with an international order based on democratic aspirations, but nevertheless under the heel of the great powers. What had been lacking in the League of Nations was overcompensated in the United Nations. With hindsight, we now can say that such a structure was bound to fall victim to the geopolitic, geopolitical realities of the 20th century and the Cold War in particular. And this indeed is what happened. For decades, the United Nations in effect absolved itself from any responsibility in the realm of the most vile human rights violations, genocide included. Decades passed without any international trials of war criminals and those guilty of taking part in genocides. During the Cold War, the absurdity of the situation became so pronounced that none of the mass killings from the 1950s until the late 1980s were denounced by the UN as genocides. Many terrible examples of atrocities could be mentioned such as the Cambodian genocide or the mass killings in East Timor when the world turned a blind eye to the wipeout of an estimated one-third of the island's population by the Indonesian army. In other words, after codifying its condemnation of genocide in a convention in 1948 and with its ratification in 1951, the UN or the international community in practice condoned genocide. It was not until the 1990s when the US Security Council established the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, ICTY, and its counterpart for Rwanda, ICTR, 
that the Genocide Convention was revived as an instrument of international justice. And the first time that the 1948 law was enforced was with the 1998 genocide convictions of Rwandan political leaders. While Serbia was cleared of direct involvement in genocide during the Bosnian War by the International Court of Justice, it was ruled that Belgrade breached international law by failing to prevent the 1995 Srebrenica genocide. And the ICTY was to look into the individual responsibilities here. But what about other offenders? There was also direct involvement in the war from outside former Yugoslav territory, namely by NATO forces, and here there were allegations raised of war crimes having been committed. The world remembers the NATO airstrikes on Belgrade during the spring and summer of 1999, when not only military but also civilian institutions came under attack. But the tribunal on Yugoslavia never showed any willingness to deal with this, and indeed it was not allowed to, because its role was clearly limited only to deal with perpetrators from inside former Yugoslavia, and in fact it was from the start directed towards certain forces and certain individuals. In other words, NATO was guaranteed impunity. The rule of law? No, hardly. Part of the development in those years was the establishment of the International Criminal Court, which came into force in 2002. This was seen by many of us uh, as a sign of opening after the end of the Cold War. It soon emerged, however, that some of the great powers would not and still do not recognize its jurisdiction, such as the United States, China, India, and Russia, undermining its authority and claim of universality. So, from an early stage, the chilly feeling set in that the new order was meant to deal with losers, not victors, bloody as the latter's hands might be. On top of this, we still had the problem of individual Security Council members blocking measures not to their liking. <clears throat> Thus, the United States still prevents any punitive measures against Israel, in spite of UN resolutions repeatedly being violated, to take an important example. But in a world full of military and economic oppression, we, or shall we say many of us, were eager to see openings to a more promising future. The fall of the Berlin Wall 30 years ago indeed gave many people hope that radical changes in the world order could be expected. Hope which seemed to be well-founded with a long overdue revival of the international justice system and new methods being developed in dealing with human rights violations. Such an idea was the UN initiative called the Responsibility to Protect. It was rooted in the failure of the international community to stop the Rwandan genocide and based on the notion that sovereignty is not a right, but a responsibility. Here, there are three main principles. That a state has a responsibility to protect its population from mass atrocities. Second, that the international community has a responsibility to assist the state to fulfill its primary responsibility. And thirdly, that if the state fails to protect its citizens, from mass atrocities, the international community has the responsibility to intervene through coercive measures such as economic sanctions or military intervention as a last resort. <clears throat> I was initially greatly impressed with this approach and at the first conference I attended organized by the ICD 
in Ljubljana in 2012 and subsequent conferences in Berlin and in Reykjavik, I spoke at length on this principle, the way it had to be developed, taking note of reservations and suggestions for modification and improvement put forward by Brazil, already fearing manipulation of the principle. These reservations proved to be well-founded. After the opening up by Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Juliana Sanz and WikiLeaks, which at present has an Icelander in charge as chief editor, Kristin Rapson, a highly respected investigative journalist and a man of integrity. After the opening up by these people of war logs and secret files showing us how blatantly regime change had been mapped out in the countries that later were to be saved under the pretext of the principle of responsibility to protect. I might add that in my home country, Iceland, WikiLeaks became well known already in 2010, long before, or, or some months, or, or, or months before, it, it, it acquired world fame after giving us insight into the darker side of finance uh, uh, transactions, partly explaining the financial crash in Ice Iceland suffered in 2008. But returning to my argument, the world's attention was now called to carefully planned operations directed at regime change in Iraq, Syria, and in no small way Libya, which was brutally attacked by NATO forces in 2011 under the pretext of the principle of responsibility to protect. Things I had taken at face value, I now began to see in a more sinister light, and what I now saw, but had not seen previously, was not to the benefit of the Western powers, which to me appear as colonial in spirit as ever. The anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall should be an occasion to ponder where we stand, where we are making progress and where we are not, what may be lacking for a new world order to function properly and in a just manner. More or less coinciding with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the military Warsaw Pact came to an end, while NATO decided to live on as a military instrument of the West this time seeking new justifications for its existence. At the 50th anniversary of NATO in 1999, we saw a market change in the way NATO was defining itself. Instead of stating merely that an attack on one member state equaled an attack on all, we now had a definition whereby a threat to one was set to equal a threat to all. All the same, uh, at the same time, there was increased emphasis on the worldwide mobility of NATO forces. NATO, which had been geographically confined to NATO territory, now had the whole world inside. Everywhere there were threats to be seen to Western interests, NATO should be ready to intervene, as was soon to be proven in Afghanistan and in Libya. But after 2010, the Pandora box, thanks to WikiLeaks, had been opened, and we had, due to the work of uh, before-mentioned whistleblowers and news providers, right from the military intestines of the US and the NATO allies, detailed information regarding regime change in different countries and the brutal methods used. To crown it all, the providers of this information are being haunted, most recently the founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, being charged in the US with espionage, the prosecutor demanding 175 years imprisonment. And the crime? Providing the world media, in other words, providing us, you and me, with news of war crimes committed by those the prosecutor works for. <laughs>
I have understood that the editors of Washington Post and the New York Times have protested the U.S. demand for extradition of Julian Assange from Britain, now pending, but they speak in whispers an outcry is needed. This is not about a single individual, also of course to be taken seriously if that was the case. It is about a free press, a free world, a world not manipulated by commercial military imperialist interests. Now, as I come to the close of my talk, there is one thing I want to mention, which I wonder why is not discussed at more depth, depth uh, these days, and that's the military buildup. Just over 30 years ago, after massive democratic movements throughout the world against nuclear weapons, not the least in this country, Germany, the superpowers came to an agreement on halting the arms race, and a pact was made on dismantling a part of the nuclear arsenals of East and West. This was revoked earlier this year, and the race reignited. One of the two signatories to the treaties of disarmament in the late 80s, Mikhail Gorbachev, warned only a few days ago, Monday this week, in an interview with the BBC, that the world was now in colossal danger. That is how he phrased it. Of a nuclear war, and that people must wake up to the danger. All nations, and I quote him verbatim, all nations must declare that all nuclear weapons must be destroyed. I said uh, I had spoken with enthusiasm about the principle of the responsibility to protect in the first meetings I attended in this institute. My enthusiasm for the very principles of protection of vulnerable people is still there. While no longer do I have the illusions I had seven years ago, and now I am more aware of the dangers that this noble principle can be misused and abused, as we have seen in Syria and Libya of late. For the principle of the responsibility to protect to function, we must have a just and democratic world order. Here a precondition is a fundamental change in the UN institutional structure. We must do away with the Security Council, a remnant of 19th century colonialism, and the power constellations of the 20th century. In fact, I am of the opinion that much more radical changes are needed in the world order. The world map must be redrawn, no less. The idea of Europe, of the regions, was, and still is, a good one. A way of transcending 19th and early 20th century map of Europe, opening up for the downplay of present day states, and the recognition of regions such as Scotland, Basque country, Catalonia, in fact, the whole world needs a new map to exchange the maps of the straight ruler-made borders of post- and post-colonial compromise. In such a world, China would have to let go of Tibet and be further disintegrated. Russia also, not to mention the United States. 50 states there instead of one is probably the answer in a world which needs to unite under a new and different form of cooperative federalism and thus make obsolete an order based on imperialist hegemony. This way, this may be in the future, you may say, but that future is needed soon if we are to survive. The 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall should not be an occasion for complacency, but an occasion for concern.